week. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the golden hour. The golden hour. This season of light, and I was thinking around, uh, you know, the Prince of Peace, season of light and all that stuff. So I was thinking about my theme for the month, and then light came to me. And then next thing it was like, okay, so what are my topics? And golden hour and all kinds of stuff came out. So we'll find out where that takes us. <laughs> but the thing that, the, that happened with the golden hour, as I was thinking about it, 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 it wasn't even the golden hour when the topic kind of came to mind. But then I started to realize how much creativity goes with our thought processes and how creative that particular hour of the day is. You know what I'm talking about, right? The golden hour, that hour just before sundown and just before, just after sunrise when the, the shadows are long and the light is going a long way through the atmosphere so it kind of radiates out the, the, the blue and you get more of that warm light. Photographers love that light. Oh yeah. If you want to get some really sweet shots, you go out during the golden hour. In fact, it's really nice because you can stand and have the sun right at your face and you don't get the squint thing going on because the light is a little bit lower, but you get this lovely look. Or you can have your, the light behind you. If you ever wanted to have the, your aura show or look like reflective light, you put the light behind you right and the sun's back here and you get this like glow thing going on. You can get your Moses moment going on, you know. <laughs> it's, really, it's really nice. See, that's, that's the beauty of it. The light is so soft that it makes everything look pretty pretty, right? And if you're, in that, in, if you're in that part of your life where you have to take your sweater off, <laughs> right? Then, then you can, it kind of, it kind of, it kind of puts that, that filter thing going on. <laughs> take off a year or two. And guys get it too. I got a fan over here blowing. 58. I think guys get it too. But that long path, it gives depth to the images and it gives, it gives dimension. You see, because a picture is a 2D thing, taking advantage of taking a picture of a 3D opportunity. So we want the kind of light that'll give a 3D, give dimension to it. And all these things, as I was thinking more about how these images feel and how they make you feel really happy. You see a golden, a golden hour light, it feel, you feel good when you look at it. It's, it's a sweet thing, you see. They actually call it, sometimes they call it the magic hour because of this golden light that's going on. It puts, it puts pizzazz into an image. And as I was thinking about the, the opportunity to do that, and, and I love taking pictures. I, I, I had so much fun. It actually, this, when I was in Oakland for the family reunion, this stuff was falling out of the sky. It was like, and, and it kept getting things wet. I think they call it rain. <laughs> and, and so I was out walking in the rain you know, people are looking at me like, what is this guy doing, you know? And, and the images, I was taking pictures because it was actually during the golden hour. It was totally by accident. I didn't plan it. That's how God works, you know? Don't plan things. God's got it all worked <laughs> out. We just need to open ourselves up. I mean, like having Arlene here and then she's going to be here on Friday. We wanted to push the event. It all works out, you know? So I'm just happening to be walking down the street at this golden hour taking these pictures and I'm, I'm like having the experience that I'm telling you about right now. It's going, wow, God, you're so cool. I love this. You know, it's just the way that all worked, right? And, and so that, that's, that's, that's what, when you think, when you ask the question, what's so good about golden light? Well, what is so good about golden light? And Laura Lim says, what's so good about golden light? Well, how about, is everything a good enough answer for you? And where that took me was to this moment of understanding what's so good about the light that each and every one of us are. Because we all have this golden light, this divine light within us. What's so good about that light? Well, is everything a good enough answer? I think so. What's so good about you? Is everything a good enough answer? I think so. Even the stuff that doesn't always look so good. It's helping you take you for the process to, involve, to evolve into the good enough answer. Everything. You know, when you think about spirit, and us expressing a spirit. We sometimes put filters over our lives. We call them limited beliefs. We sometimes uh, put a special texture over our life, some of our habits, right? But when you look at light in the golden hour, the magic light, it doesn't need a filter. It doesn't have a texture that it puts over it. It's natural and it's authentic. And so when we can stand in our golden light, we can stand in our golden light. 
we can stand in a place of authenticity. We can live our natural selves. We can take off the filters of experience and we can move beyond the habits that limit us from where we express the everything that's good about us. So there I am getting soaked, totally vamping on this talk, going, yeah, I get it. Oh, there's another picture. <coughs> you know, having my tangent moments while I'm getting this download. <laughs> it was like, it was so, it was so wonderful to see that, that like spirit, the golden light moving through me is calling me, is calling you to work through whatever limiting thoughts we have, filters, whatever habitual patterns we have, special textures, to move beyond that so we can live a more authentic and a more natural life. Now, <laughs> when I... <laughs> The other thing I thought about was that here I am taking all these pictures on my phone, which has all kinds of filters in it and all kinds of great ways to take shots. In fact, I don't feel like I take one right now. Wait a minute. Oh, there it is. Well, no, I got to hold it at this right angle because that thing up there, there. There it is. Hi, everybody. Wave. Hi. Can I, can I post this later? You guys okay with that? I, I see you. I didn't forget you. <laughs> All right. Hi. Hi. Nice. Where was I? <laughs> so that's real simple. Done. Later today, I'll just post that. It'll be on Facebook. Boom. Done. Right. But back in the day, y'all remember that day, ectochrome days, right? You'd have to like develop the stuff. You got to go and sniff nasty chemicals and drop it in and lift it up and bang it on something. And it was a lot of work to do that stuff. It was like not that easy as it was just now. And I was thinking about that when I was out taking my pictures. And then it got me back to when I was working at KTBC. KTBC, which stands for uh, K Times Broadcasting, but it was a station that was owned by Lady Bird Johnson. And she actually lived in the penthouse during the time that I worked there. And I used to uh, carry her groceries upstairs for Nellie, her cook, and they would make me lunch. <laughs> and so I would like sit with Lady Bird Johnson, and, and Lyndon Johnson was my grandfather's favorite president. So I was like, wow, you know, I so wish he was here right now to experience what I'm experiencing, hanging out with Lady Bird. That's so cool. <laughs> and her secret service agents were my buddies, and they came to a party one time that I had and arrested me in the middle of the party. And everybody was like freaking out. But they were just playing because they were actually coming to the party. But people were like, whoa, what did he do? <laughs> He just happened to know Secret Service agents who like to pull out their badges and handcuffs on people. <laughs> They've gotten in a lot of trouble for that, haven't they? So here I am working at this TV, at this TV station. I'm 18 years old, so I think I know everything, right? Because 18-year-olds you know, think they know everything. So sometimes I still think I must be 18. And <laughs> and, and they asked me, the, the news director asked me, Gerardi, he says, so... Um, can you can you shoot film? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and with a CP sixteen A? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And a Bell and Howell DXR seventy? Got it. And you can run the film processor? Sure can. <laughs> Didn't know how to do none of it. But that's what they gave me the job as a film processor. So you got these professional photographers, right, who are going out all day shooting this beautiful film for the news. David N. Smith and George Walter and George Brown and Arnie Cantu and all these great photographers that went on to CBS and NBC and great, great jobs in the future. And here I am, 18 years old, and they give me this film, and I'm supposed to develop it. And I don't even really even know how, you know? And, and back then, the, the, the mag, the, the, the camera mag, it, it, the film went into the box, but it didn't have the sides on it. It was just a core with the blank film. And so you'd have to go into the, into the, edit, into the uh, dark room and open up the thing and, and let the film come out into your hand and then grab it with the one finger inside the spindle and the other finger on the outside of the roll of film. But the film's just no walls on either side of it, right? And so I hear I'm the first day out, right? And I take the thing out. I'd been trained, so I take the thing out. I know I'm, I'm doing it because I'm 18. I know how to do this. And I drop that, and that, that film went <laughs> 
and I'm in the dark. You don't realize how I, you can see in the dark if you need to. I mean, I'm like, <laughs> I'm down on the ground, I'm doing it, I'm trying to staple, because you got to staple the pieces of film together to run them through the processor that just goes up and down and up and down and up and down. It was complicated. I don't know what the point of that story was. <laughs> The point of the story is, <laughs> thank God this was up here, <laughs> that it's a lot simpler to live through your golden light than to deal with the processing it takes to think about all the stuff that you've thought about over the years to get you to where you want to go. All the layers and the habits and the don't do this and you should do it this way and, you, and the would of the could of the should is that we put ourselves through are just getting us in the way when it's really just as simple as pulling out your iPhone and hitting the button. It's not so difficult as going in there and running up and down through the film processor, through all of the processors that we do in our brains to make something happen. If we just let go and go to the divine, Whoa, Arlene shows up just on time with the right songs. You know, that's how this works. That was <laughs> Welcome to my brain. <laughs> that's how it works. <laughs> now, no, actually, I got it. Thank you. I did, I did figure it out. However, no, no, I actually stayed there. I stayed there for 17 years and Joe Roddy became my mentor and I went directly from Austin to LA. It was a great experience. It was a great experience. But that particular day though, what did happen is I put a twist in the film. So halfway through the thing, the processor stopped. So I had to turn the lights out in the whole processing room and go into the machine and find where it would twist it and untwist it and retaple it back together again. So that, yeah, that was a sweaty moment. That was like, David in! I had to call David N. Smith to come in and help me. He came in and fixed it for me. But yeah, that, that, was, that was the worst and, and the best day because I learned my lesson. And the lesson was ask for help when you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So um, staying with the light, the next thing this, this journey of light took me to was to scripture, because I, you know, I will admit to you that I, I am standing here with that REV in front of your name, and it, it makes you want to think that you're not supposed to make mistakes, and you've got to know what you're doing, and all that kind of stuff. But I'm going to tell you right now, I did not read the Bible until I got to Founders Church back in 2001. I took a class with Arthur Chang, and I said, you know, I've never really read the whole Bible. I mean, I've opened it up and read some passages, and I did the, oh, God, please, if, I, if, you, just, if you just do this for me now, I'll never do that again prayer. I did a lot of those prayers, you know, but I never really studied the stuff. So I said, Arthur, uh, Dr. Arthur, uh, well, he was Reverend Arthur then. I said, uh, you know, I've never really uh, read the Bible. What do you suggest? He says, oh, I got something for you. And the next day he brought me a children's Bible. <laughs> now I want you to know, if you're starting out Bible study, that is the greatest way to go. Because not only is it simple and direct, they got pictures. <laughs> And it makes the Bible really friendly. And so it's become, it's become friendly. And I often thought, you know, some of you may, may know that there's, there's like not many manuals for living, but there are a few. One of them is a book that's blue, and that's a nice manual for living. And one of them is the New Testament and the Old Testament. There's a great manual for living. So I see the Bible now as a manual for living. And as I studied it and thought about it and was thinking about this talk, I thought about, you know, Jesus and Moses and, and, and even the Buddha and people that you've met who've had an aura. It seems like they have a glow, a light around them. And they talk about that a lot in Scripture, that there is this light around us. And we talked about earlier in our journey here, when I came here, we talked about uh, on the first day God created light. And light was not the light of light, it was the light of consciousness. So when we think about ideas, we think about ideas as light. One of the things that we use when we represent ideas is a bing, light bulb, right? You've seen that image of Homer Simpson with the <laughs> thing, right, with the light bulb inside of his head. We, so light bulb. Genesis also talks about the word. In the Bible, they talk about the word. And every word that we speak sparks an idea in our brain. And that spark, if you think about a spark, if you visualize a spark, you see a light 
even in that moment, there's always this thing about light. Consciousness is associated with light. Let there be light. Let your light shine, right? So the illumined ones had this light, that this season that we celebrate this guy who came to the planet to give this message was a reminder. His life, his three-year ministry was a life of reminding us that we are the lights, that we are lights bringing consciousness into the world, bringing something wonderful into the world. And Dr. Holmes has a lovely concept about this. He says, there is a light at the center of everyone. Each of us has it. But it does seem that while by reason of any fact, this light is never obliterated. Never obliterated. It is obscured. Whoa. We always have this light within us, right? We always have this light within us. But our, our experiences of life, the facts of our life, will sometimes obscure that light. But nothing can blow that light away. Nothing can blow that light out. It is in you forever. And so whenever you get down about anything that's going on in your life, remember that that light is within you. And it's just waiting for the obscuring to be wiped away so that it can shine that much brighter within you. And that's what our journey is. And that's the golden moment that we have available to us. See, there's light throughout our body. We've got cells, and then we've got uh, molecules, and then we've got atoms. And you know what happens when they split an atom, right? A lot of power right there. So we have a lot of power within us as we break into the light that is within our very souls. I do a lot of not as many as I'd like to, definitely not as many as Patrick, workshops. And one of the things I like to do when I do a workshop is to set an altar at the workshop. Have you ever noticed altars? Do you have altars at home? Any of you guys have your own altar? It's really a lovely thing. Try, to, try it. Try it out. Try creating your own altar at home. And it doesn't have to be all gaudy and everything like that. And I don't mean like gaudy. Gaudy. <laughs> it can be gaudy if you like. It's your journey. But... You know, like just, uh, but one of the things that's really lovely to have on your altar is to, is to put a candle on it. And if everywhere you go, when you see altars, you will see candles on them. Because that is to remind us that we are light, that that light is within us. We all have that. When I go to workshops, I set up a, an altar and I have people bring things in. And I always bring a candle. Boom. We have a candle here to remind us that that sacred light is a part of who we are. It's the connector. It's a visual reminder of who and what we are and where we come from. And light is also a thought carrier. You know, when we have the thoughts that work through our brains, they, care, they travel on light. Sometimes it's light we can't see, but they travel on light. There's this creative power within the light. And Dr. Holmes uh, talks about that creative power as a, as a mental equivalent. He says, beyond all mental equivalents, beyond all human experience, breaking down every precedent, there is a light that you and I have to follow. And boy, that's when life gets fun and sometimes tricky. But we have this light within us that we are here to express. There's something that draws us. There's some golden moment that we're waiting to, to just burst into. It's that, it's that time when you, when, you, when, you know, when you hit that perfect golf shot. I mean, I'm not a golfer, but I had that experience one time where I hit the golf ball and something magical happened. I'm like, wow. Or here's the one that really got me. I grew up left-handed. And so, and I am left-handed and I, I played sports as a kid left-handed and I was terrible at everything. And one day I went to a baseball game and they didn't have enough gloves, so I ended up having a glove on my left hand instead of a glove on my right hand, which is what a baseball, right, left-hander thrower has a right-handed glove. But I had a left-handed glove on. And what I was doing all day was trying to put the glove on my right hand backwards, you know, and just got tired of doing that. So I put it on my left hand and I actually caught a ball like I had never caught a ball before. And then I took the ball out of the glove and I threw the ball and I realized, oh my God, I'm ambidextrous. <laughs> but by then I was like 14 and, and the talk about textures and, and, and limited thoughts and filters. By that time, I had already had a filter over me that I was bad in sports and I wasn't any good at it and I couldn't get it, get it right. You know, it took me years. I'm still trying to work through that process of all those years of thinking I'm no good. But really, it was just that I was right-handed. There was a light waiting to come. And when I threw that ball, phew, it lit me up. 
And I love sports now. I just don't play much, but I do. I play this kind of sport. Yay, that was a good run. Yay, yay. You know? So this light is within you, and we can either allow it or resist it. You know? Allow it or resist it. That's what we get to do. We get to realize that, see, each and every one of us is a spiritual genius waiting to come forth. So I invite you to activate your spiritual genius in this moment. And, and when you think about this mental equivalence idea, you know, there are, the mental equivalent works like this. My gas tank holds 18.6 gallons in my Westphalia. 18.6 gallons. That's all it holds. That's all I'm going to put into it. That's, what, that's the equivalent of my gas tank. If I want to put more gas in, the, in that car, I have to put a five-gallon tank on the outside in a little container. Now, right, now I've got, what's that, 23 and a half gallons of gas, 23.6 gallons of gas. I have to expand my mental equivalent. That's how it works. If you have an idea around something and that's all you can see, that's all you will, that's all you will experience. If you can expand that idea, put an extra gas tank on the side, you can have a longer journey, a longer journey, okay? That's how we move through this. Remember my friend Erica that I talked about at the bamboo bowl some weeks ago who put her food, the Mongolian bowl, and she would put the, the, the romaine lettuce around the outside so that her bowl would be bigger See, that's an expanded mental equivalent. We want to expand our mental equivalent so that we can break down these precedents, so that we can follow that light that is within us. That's how this thing works, you know. And we can find a way. We can always find a way because we are reflectors of the divine light. We're reflectors of that source that's within us. You know, when you look at the moon, it's really neat when you think about what the moon does. You got the moon over here, and the people that are looking at the moon can't see the sun. What a great setup. So they created this thing called the moon that can reflect the sun. The moon is not the source of the light, it's the reflector of the light. Right? So we get to do that same thing. We can turn our attentions to the light and reflect it back. We can reflect back source at any time that we want to. And, and that's, a, that's a lovely thing to think about, that you are that experience of, 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 of the divine. You are the experience of God having this opportunity to create through the wonder and through the genius that you are. I love Esther Hicks. She says, uh, or Abraham, I can't do that voice she does. The stream is constantly flowing to you. Think of the stream as the light. The stream, the light, is constantly flowing to you, never ending, never tiring, always there for your consideration. Now that's a lovely thought. It's always there for your consideration. You are at choice at every moment of your life. You can choose to accept it, or you can just blow it off and keep on living life the way you have. And if it's working out, we can do the Dr. Phil. How's that working for you? <laughs> and if it's working okay, that's fine. I'm not here to change anything for you. But if it's not working, you can open it up because it's always there and it's never tired. It never gets tired of being ignored. That's the really sweet thing about it. Talk about grace and love. This light, this divine light that's within you, this ability that you have to expand beyond the limits of where you have already been is not bored by you going, nah, not today. It'll be there tomorrow. I'm not saying you should sit on it till tomorrow, but if you should happen to do that, forgive yourself and go on about your business. There's always time because the light is always there. Your golden light. Matthew says it so, or Jesus said it so well in Matthew. He says, let your light so shine before men that, may, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And we know where heaven is, right? Consciousness, it's within us, right? It's how we think. And so, wow, when you let your light shine and people see your good works, it glorifies your Father divine which lives within you. In other words, you feel good when you do your good stuff. Not a bad deal for doing the good work in your life. Live it. Live your spiritual truth. Allow the wisdom of the divine to come through you. And it comes through you as this really sweet thing called intuition. And once the intuition hits, the imagination gets fired and you're off and you're running. And you have this opportunity to get there. And, you know, when you get on the road, it may take a few things to get there. Like patience and knowing. A certain determination. This week, I did the family reunion thing. I went to Oakland, all right? Now, sometimes I drive up there, and I know that it's going to take a certain number of hours to get there. And 
I don't get bothered by the fact that it's going to take that certain number of hours to get there. In fact, I'm just going to go ahead and do the drive. If the traffic backs up, that's okay. I'll just, the five can back up like that. I'm just going to take my time. And I'm going to get there because I know Oakland's there and I know it's this far away. I don't get upset along the way and go back home because I know I'm going to Oakland and I know Oakland is there. So when we're on our journey to where we're going, I'm calling forth this idea to not give up, to not revert back to where you are to not go back because you're not going to get there if you do that. See, you're already in the perfect place you need to be to get there from right here simply by having a certain amount of determination and patience and knowing that the destination is there. Oakland is there. It's just six hours up the road with a stop along the way at Peterson to get some Starbucks. Okay? So I want you to remember, remember the golden hour, the magic hour, the golden light within you where there is warmth and depth and presence and dimension. There's flair and there's beauty. It make you look purdy, <laughs> the golden hour. It frees your imagination. It gives you an opportunity in the golden light to follow your magic, to allow your mystical self to become your realized self so that those around us can see the glory of your good works. Thomas Troward says, take care of the heart and the head will take care of the rest. If you feel it within, then the law, the law of the universe will put the logic and the reason into the process so that you get to Oakland on the other end of the journey, you see? But you just gotta go for that feeling. You gotta take off the filters and just accept your natural, authentic self and have a little trust that the destination will get there. Feel it first and your golden hour will be realized and you too will feel the magic. And so it is. So now, does the affirmation make a little more sense? Let's do it again. Here we go. The warm glow of spirit's presence illuminates my soul and shines a golden light on the good that is my life. And so it is. There it is. Post it, tweet it, put it online somewhere. Let's hear about that, okay? Ah. Prayer time. Mm. My good friend Quentin Denard gave me a call the other day. He says, I want you to pray for my friends. Their daughter was in San Bernardino. It was one of the 14. That's how close it can be. That's how close. So now we've all been personally affected. Wow. It's just amazing. And it's not just there. It's not just San Bernardino. It's all over the world. It's people getting in boats with their children to cross the sea. There's people sleeping on the road, on the side of the road in India, in the dirt, that don't have a bed. It's folks down in South Central that aren't going to get Christmas gifts this year. It's all around us, and we live in an abundant, prosperous universe that's infinite in its expansion and loving in its gifts. Sometimes, for some reason, we've decided to hoard and to hold and to believe in lack and limitation. So in this healing prayer today, join me as I, as I call forth the spirit of the divine in each and every one of us and recognize that God is the life that we are living and that all the good and all the glory is right here present for us. And in that same wisdom, we have been given dominion over our minds and our consciousness. As Dr. Holmes says, we have been left alone to make the great discovery for ourselves, and we are still on the journey. There is so much more for us to discover. But we shall not be undaunted. We shall not sit back and give up. For we know that where wholeness exists, which is right here, right now, wholeness is revealed through a consciousness that knows. We hold a high mental equivalent, you and I, and we allow our minds 
to stand in that equivalent and to envision this world here right now where people have food, where people have needs met, where their voices are heard in ways that catch them before they move into a violent act, where there is compassion and understanding, where borders exist, surely borders exist, distinctions are a part of life, but they are realized as the illusionary activities that they are, that we can transcend them. You see, we break through borders all the time, and we call it good. So we see that as an opportunity for the rest of the world to break through the borders and the barriers and the limitations of life so that we can see the good. I affirm this as a reality in the world today. And on the personal note, we have folks within our own congregation who have been going through health challenges. So we just are so grateful for the people in the world who decide to give their lives over to a career that brings medicine and healing to the physical body. And we know that by activating our minds, we enhance that physicality <laughs> through our consciousness. We know that there are people that are looking for places to live, and we, we right now affirm right homes, perfect jobs, harmony in relationship, the release of habits that no longer serve, and the acceptance of habits that allow better life to unfold. We know that all this is not possible, it is reality. And in this moment, we see the reality realized. I'm so grateful for the power of prayer. I'm so grateful for the vision and the intuition and the imagination and the consciousness that allows us to hold these thoughts for just a moment as we accept a moment of gratitude for this process and then take these thoughts and release them into a law that knows, that hears, that answers with a yes. Affirm it is good with me now. Affirm it is true. And so it is. All right.